Hi, hi. We are going to talk about all the Western TV shows I watched in 2018. Um, this is in order of how much I liked them ascendingly, but I wouldn't really call it a list or anything. I, I'm pretty out of touch when it comes to Western TV. I just watch a really small assortment, mostly of just things that, I, that I'd already been watching and that I wanted to continue watching. Um, so I, I wouldn't say as anywhere near, uh, like, music or anime where I feel like I have some sense, at least, of all of the stuff that came out this year um, that I was interested in. I'm pretty sure that if I actually watch Western TV with the same sort of uh, intensity and focus, uh, this, this would be a completely different assortment of shows and uh, a completely different sort of list, so... It's just all of them. I just wanted to talk about all of them briefly. Uh, I watched the first season of this show, mostly for Millennials. Um, this was produced by Derek Biggle, something like that. This this man here, who is a writer for the Eric Andre show, which I quite like. And the show is quite similar to the Eric Andre show in that it's sort of a very surreal, um, aggressively strange parody of, of a show. Um, the Eric Andre show being a parody of a late night talk show and this being kind of a really over-the-top parody of the sort of show that an out-of-touch network executive would commission a studio to make to try to appeal to millennials, hence the, the very on-the-nose title mostly for millennials. Uh, like the Eric Andre show, it's a variety of kind of like skit type things, um, real world interaction prank type segments and interviews. Um, also like the Eric Andre show, it's like very aggressively strange, lots of really kind of gross out type humor, um, lots of just kind of going and in increasingly surreal tangents. And that sort of humor I really like. Um, that's what I look to a lot of Adult Swim shows for. Um, but this show really showed me that I do have lines, like that there are certain subsets of these things that I like and that I really dislike. And unfortunately, the show was mostly in the latter camp for me. I was mostly just like grossed out um, by most of the gross out humor. I, I wasn't really kind of in that good space that Eric Andre can get me into where I'm just so shocked and at his creativity for, for going so far. It's more just that I'm I'm shocked at the depravity of of Derek going so far, and and it's not so engrossing for me, just grossing. <laughs> um, some of the the real world interaction stuff I, I found pretty funny. He does like a lot of like focus group type things. Um, you can often get people saying and doing some pretty strange things in those, which I, I kind of find amusing, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think what I realized that I really missed was the, the presence of a character like Hannibal, um, who, although he does strange things on his own, kind of serves as like a straight man to some extent to Eric Andre. And I never would have thought that I would be asking for a straight man in my humor. Typically, I, I prefer, you know, the more crazy, the better. Um, and I think kind of having a character that's just sort of there to punctuate and explain the jokes is, is often unnecessary. But um, Hannibal provides such stability to the Eric Andre show, such a sense of, like, continuity. It gives you, like, some kind of place to approach the show that, that grounds it in something real. Whereas here, there's sort of an assorted cast, um, uh, that, that shows up occasionally. Like, there's the, the girls that are always kind of laughing at things happening, and there's, like, the audience members that often reoccur. Um, but there's no real consistency to them. Like they're they're just as absurd and and willing to go onto whatever tangents and uh, strange developments as as Derek. So it's like you don't really have that like grounding factor with Hannibal. Um, and and same with the interviews too. It it kind of feels like right from the get go because they're appearing on this bizarre show called Mostly for Millennials. They already know something is up, and thus to kind of keep it jarring and keep it unsettling from them, uh, Derek has to go to like real bizarre extremes and, and basically just tries to gross them out quite often. Whereas with Eric Andre, you, you got a kind of sense that, I, I'm not sure how often this actually happens, but they could have been marketed the show as just like a normal late night talk show. Like, you know, it's just called The Eric Andre Show. There's nothing inherently weird about that. 
and seeing the celebrities slowly come to realize just how insane the predicament they've found themselves in is, is really engrossing to me. And again, it's all about the kind of like baseline of stability on which you build the humor. Um, something like The Tim and Eric Show, which of course gets to really surreal extremes, always kind of grounded itself initially with each premise in kind of normal parody, like a normal situation, reflecting something about the real world. Whereas this is just, it's like out there. It's just all out there. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that appeals to some people and, and I can kind of understand how cool that is on some level, just to be able to, to move beyond parody and, and go to a space of like parodying something that doesn't even quite exist. Um, but it, I don't know, it just didn't really do it for me. Okay, moving on. Uh, this this one was another disappointment. Um, I wasn't the biggest fan of, of season four. Um, and then I watched the, the season four remix, uh, Unintended Consequences or something like that. Uh, where they, they chopped up all of season four such that it was presented in more chronological order. Um, and I think that helped a bit. Uh, but I think really the problem is they just don't have the actors together that often. And so much of the show revolves around kind of banter between the established characters and stuff. Like that's where most of the memorable comedic moments in the original, for me at least, came from. Was just like really good tight writing between the cast and then plot lines that very cleverly intersected each other in a way that revealed some grand irony or, or some really shockingly hilarious conclusion. Um, as they had to f film with like less and less of the cast uh, at, at a time, just because everyone's schedule is so busy, um, I think they lost a lot of that and it went more and more to kind of just like disparate wacky plot lines um, and this has like a number of really compounding problems uh, first off I, I think the original West Arrested Development worked because they could always balance like kind of a wacky plot line which was the A plot some big scheme that was happening with more grounded B and C plots that just sort of brought the characters together uh, whereas here because everyone kind of has to be doing their own A plot there's just such an absurd stack of things happening that really don't have that much to do with each other. Um, and in order to, to have any sort of semblance of connection between them, what ends up happening is that there's like these long scenes scattered throughout the entire show where characters are basically just explaining to each other what's happening. And that's not like terrible in and of itself. Like I've been rewatching a lot of Seinfeld recently. And it, it made me realize just how often there are scenes where one of the main characters is just explaining their plot to another character. Um, and it's good because they can get some jokes in there and it gives them a, a chance to connect the plot lines if that's something they're going to do. But here, because the plot lines are like so elaborate for each and every character, these explanation scenes start feeling like very tedious and they start really exposing just how absurd the plot lines have gotten. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just kind of feel like the magic is gone in a lot of ways. Um, like, I can start to notice the patterns they're trying to build up. Like, they kind of go back to the glory years of the first three seasons and, and look for something that worked and then kind of try to structurally replicate it with the parts they have available to them now. Um, and it, I don't know, it just, it's really sad. Like, it, it really feels like this is all just unnecessary. The, the end of season three was strange, but it was fine. They could have just stopped there. And season four, it did have some very hilarious moments that I think kind of made it worth it in the long run. Like everything to do with Job and the bees I found hilarious. And finding out that George Michael's app wasn't actually anything he said it was. And instead it was just a, a woodblock simulator. Like that, that's like a really quality joke. Um, but it, it kind of felt like everything was just hung up by those few moments of hilarity. Um, whereas here, we don't really even have that. I, I wouldn't say there's any jokes in this season that really stood out to me as memorable or hilarious. Uh, it just It's just kind of the, the bones of it strewn upon the ground. Yeah, I don't know. The, the second half of the fifth season, I, I believe, is either out now or very soon. But I'm, it's, it's going to have to be pretty miraculous to make up for this. Okay, moving on. 
Uh, this I was also a little... Uh, it seemed okay. Um, I, I like this show because it's such an efficient, effective sitcom. I don't need it to be amazing. I don't need it to be groundbreaking or anything like that. Uh, I just like seeing the characters. I like hearing the jokes. So just more, 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 please. But again, I thought that, but it, this season kind of showed me that there are like some limits that I have to that. Um, I think what bugs me that they started really doing in the season is like a total absence of connection between the A and B plots. And it's tough to write a funny good A plot and funny good B plot and then have a way that they connect together. Um, it's hard, but it's worth doing. Or at the very least, you should have some sort of thematic overlap, some, some kind of like a joke that appears in one and then the other, or like a lesson that's learned by one that you realize applies to the other or something. Uh, but here, it's very rare that the characters in the A plot will even talk to the characters in the B plot once. They'll just happen totally in parallel with absolutely nothing to do with each other. And the B plot in one could have easily been substituted with the B plot in the other with absolutely no loss of meaning uh, or humor, um, except that the characters have to be divided. <laughs> um, and it's, it's disappointing because it, it just kind of makes the show feel a little empty. Um, and I don't, and it kind of seemed like they were phoning it in with some of the A plots and B plots, you know, like a lot of just like, well, what if this person and this person had to go do this? And it's like, that's fine. Like, that is fine to me. That kind of phoning it in. But you, you got to go like at least one extra step and have a bit of connection. Otherwise, it just sort of feels like, why am I, like, what is this all building to? Like, what is the point of all of this? Um, also, okay, so... You know, that, that's like a problem to me. The, the most extreme of it is that there were there were episodes I noticed where the A plot and B plot, and this actually became like a little minor obsession for me. I noticed episodes where the A plot and B plot weren't even chronologically in order, where it would be clear that in the A plot, multiple days had passed, and then it cuts back to the B plot, and it's like later that same day. And that was just like, I was just like, oh my god, like, how, how are they trying to get away with this? I mean, you know, frankly, no one cares, and I'm just a huge nerd, but, like, oh my god, like, what? Like, is that okay? Do, do shows normally do this and I just don't notice? I don't think so. I think it's actually, like, an unprecedented level of, of kind of um, just shoving in your A plot and B plot. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, so they... There's most of the episodes are like that. It's just an A plot and a B plot, and they have nothing to do with each other. In other episodes, they do go for more of a dramatic arc. They have all of the characters involved. Um, it's something that has like plot significance, and those are generally better. Those are usually the things that can make for like really standout episodes. But I think the problem that they're running into is like they just don't know how to do a good climax for them. Um, there was like a few episodes where the climax even happened like during the credit scenes. And it was just sort of like, oh, yeah, by the way, we, we saved the branch or something. <laughs> like, it, it just felt, again, kind of phoned in, but very, in a, in a way that's kind of forgiving because it's like they, they prioritize doing jokes first and then like lessons second and then maybe like an action sequence. And then when it comes to the actual like resolution and aftermath of, of the thing that maybe we've been even building up to for like several episodes... It's just kind of like, well, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> it was taken care of. Oh, okay. Um, I believe this is the season that had, like, the jail arc. I thought that was really good. It was such a mix-up of, of location, and, and the jokes were just so surreal. Um, I thought it was kind of, like, morally strange that they made so many jokes about how awful prison is, when so often in other situations they were like, haha, we're, we're locking up the bad guys, yeehaw, we're cops, like... I don't know. I it seems like the the show's moral stance on police is is really all over the map, <laughs> um, just kind of depending on what can make for good jokes. So I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, ACAB people. Uh, but overall, it's okay. I mean, I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm I'm still watching it. I think it's gotten better since it came to NBC. I, I see that like a few of the problems I just mentioned kind of seem to be fixed. Um, but I don't know. It, it just kind of seems like they're like, all right, we did it. We, we have our formula. Let's just take it to the bank. I'm sure. Look at this. This man here. 
The money he makes, you know what he does with it? He puts it into a joint savings account for him and his wife and his newborn baby. And you know what that means? It means that Joanna Newsom, his wife, can do whatever the heck she wants for the rest of her life. That her music was so beautiful that she bagged a man with a syndicated TV sitcom. Like, that's fine. That's fine. You know how happy I am for her? All of this is just blessed. Okay. Uh, then I watched... 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 What? Why would it... This this has happened before. There we go. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, season four. The, the first part of season four. The second part is out now. I've, I've started watching it, but I haven't seen that much of it yet. Again, I kind of thought... Mm, the, the best days of the show were, were sort of behind it. Um, I... I think the episode where they did the fake documentary about the the reverend, the guy who who locked her up all those years ago. I assume you know the premise of the show. It takes too long to explain otherwise. Um, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, at the same time, I, I kind of feel like all the story arcs in the series, uh, since the f the first season or so, have again. Oh, well, actually, no. Even the second season, there was some really nice kind of climaxes, but. It's, it's just this sort of thing that sitcoms do where, like, they, they can't overdo it. Where, like, once you know you got a good thing going, you don't want to rock the boat. And so it seems like a lot of things that looked like they were going to be, like, major story developments kind of land on, like, anticlimaxes and things just sort of return to the mode. Um, it's like, okay, I get it, but it's a little disappointing to see. Um, and, and I think most shows don't escape this curse. Like, I can think of very, very few shows that escape this curse. Because either they do rock the boat, and sometimes it just ends up for the worse that they rock the boat. I, I kind of lump community into that camp, uh, who, which I, I don't think survive very well. Like, lots of cast changes and, and kind of tonal changes and stuff. Um, or, like... You, you just have to get, like, a lot funnier. And I think this is the only, like, real way to to mitigate the effects of this curse. Like, a show like 30 Rock, I think, does it exquisitely. Um, because they just kept making the characters funnier. Like, they were just able to write the characters better and better and better. So the jokes just landed better and better and better, I find. Um... And, and that by the end, they when they started actually playing their cards of like big emotional significance and, and really started rocking the boat, it, it felt very triumphant and climactic. Um, yeah, I don't know. So it's okay. I, I still find it funny. There's like certain types of comedy that it goes for that really doesn't land for me. Like sometimes they kind of go for like gross out humor, which although I say I like in the context of like Eric Andre or, or Adult Swim or something, uh, when I'm watching a show like this, I just find it utterly unnecessary and, and not pleasant. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's fine. Had some good, like, lessons, I guess. Uh, this I, I liked quite a lot, um, and I was very sorry to hear that it was, it was cancelled. This is another sitcom called Great News. Uh, the second season aired last year. It's, like, very much in the mode of 30 Rock. My, my feeling is that, like, the 30 Rock team, who also worked on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, there's some... I don't really know the details, but there's quite a lot of, like, overlap between those two groups. And then it also kind of feels like they, they're, like, hedging their bets. <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, let's show, you know, we're, we're doing our best, but it's pretty crazy, right? Like, is this going to be what people want? So they're like, all right, we might as well just do, like, another 30 Rock. <laughs> <laughs> just to be safe. So this is set at a news station. It's about a, a news writer who's a very Liz Lemon-esque character. Um, but the the expanded cast around her is, is quite different, or at the very least, it kind of feels like everybody's been shuffled up quite a bit uh, from the sort of archetypes that we know and love in 30 Rock. Um, I was pretty impressed. Like, I think it's pretty funny. I, I think it really has a lot of the same kind of quality of humor as 30 Rock, like the same density of jokes and and just sort of really tight episode writing with, you I mean, you want to talk about like overlapping A and B plots, like this, this is the, the master course in it. Um, just being able to, to push 
two very solid, funny on their own plots and directions that makes it like shockingly surprising when they they kind of ca often catastrophically cross. Um, nice, good multi-episode arcs too, with a genuine feeling of like intrigue and suspense that I, I think uh, is well suited to a show about news writing and investigation and stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have nothing but good things to say about this show. I think it's a real shame that it got cancelled. Uh, I, I kind of feel like the problem is that it just didn't really hit any demographic that strongly. Um, there's, there's, I don't know, like, <laughs> the, the audiences that are going to relate to some of the characters on the show, like her or her mom or, or Chuck, the aging newsman, um, are like not the types that are necessarily going to be watching a show like this. And then kind of the other characters that, that might actually be more targeted towards uh, the audience of people who watches a lot of sitcoms, which I actually don't know who that is, but I know that I watch a lot of sitcoms, so maybe there's someone like me, mid-twenties. <laughs> um, and like... For them, those characters are presented more as like distant, di like alienated caricatures, if you know what I mean. Like they're more like the object of the humor than the subject of it, and it's more like the the older characters are are more s subjectified. Um, so I don't know, like, man, man I'm trying to think of like how sitcoms work demographically, like who is supposed to be watching them and what relationship they're supposed to have with the characters on the show can sometimes get like really mind-boggling. So we're just going to move on. Uh, this is another sitcom I watched the first season of. Uh, I really liked it. I, I think it's hilarious. Um, we talked a bit about it before in another video, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's about this guy who's played by Dennis from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I forget the actor's real name. Uh, he's an AP bio teacher in high school. He does not give a poop about his job at all. He just wants to use uh, the brain resource that is his class in order to get revenge on a smarmy author with which he has a feud. Um, it hits on like so many levels. I think it's got like really good kind of high school humor. Um, it, it feels like very an authentic recreation of that sort of environment. And just the number of characters they have in the classroom allows for like a really bizarre um, mix of extremes. Um, I, I think the the philosophical humor that they interject at times is is actually quite grounded in legitimate thought, which is cool, which is kind of rare. <laughs> uh, usually, when people make jokes about the sort of things that I'm like nerdy about, I'm just like, Pfft. but you know, they they put in the effort. Um, I think the, the writing is great. Again, fantastic use of like A and B plot connectivity and, and kind of this clusterfuck type feeling. Um, good multi-episode arcs, good feelings of triumph, no, no real anticlimactic moments, but, but actually things feeling like they have the full impact that they had been built up to have. Yeah, man, great show. No, nothing but good things to say. And, and the heart within it that I was so scared of because I'm always worried that with sitcoms with kid characters they're gonna like coddle the kids and it's gonna be like really sappy and boring um but here they're they're really ruthless about the kid characters like the the Dennis character just lays into them all the time which is very hilarious to me and and sometimes shocking that NBC would allow a show where just a grown man bullies children all the time to exist and then, because they went so hard on that, when the moments that they he actually does like connect with the kids, you know, you know, they they got to do that by the end. He does connect with the kids, and he becomes a little sympathetic with them, and he he learns their struggles and stuff. And it it, it actually landed with me, like I I was actually kind of moved, and that was surprising. I did not think <laughs> that aspect of the show I would ever be sold on, but you know, good for them. There's a second season. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I heard it didn't get good ratings though. I think this sort of humor is maybe not for most people, um, and the sort of things I liked about it uh, often weren't just like the base humor of it, like how hard I was laughing at it, but more just like 
oh, that was well written. Like, oh, good, they tied that back in. Like, oh, and most people don't care about that. <laughs> most people, they watch a sitcom because they want it to be funny. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see if it has, has legs, if we're going to get to the syndication with this one. But I, I think I'm going to enjoy it, whatever they're going to do with it. Uh, I watched this, the 13th season of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, of course featuring our, our boy, whose name completely escapes me. What's that guy's name? Crap. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, this one was like, uh, a lot of people were worried because of his commitment to the show that he wasn't going to be in very much of this season, and the previous season had ended with him dramatically announcing that he was leaving, he was going to become a, a regular person and start a family, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, this could be rough. Again, uh, if you make big changes in a sitcom like this, it's it's kind of rocking the boat. Um, but no, <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they didn't really change that much. Um, there were episodes where he was missing, but I think it was handled quite well. Um, either through like extensive like meta analysis of of what that entails for him to leave the show in a way that I thought was was really a creative and exciting send up of like a lot of the fan speculation and such. Uh, normally that sort of thing, if it's too on the nose, I, I find it very annoying. But they they did it well, um, and a lot of these episodes were just hilarious too. Um, they they went to some real extremes. Um, they, you know, like, there's the clip show, where they finally did the clip show, but then in a community-esque move, it deviates further and further into clips that didn't happen, and then it gets into this really awesome mind-bending, inception-y thing where they're, they're trying to convince each other that things actually happened. Um, it was hilarious to me. Uh, there's the really good one where they, they, they attend the seminar on sexual harassment, um, I, I really like this episode because it, it actually is grounded in a principle that I believe in. Um, like so many episodes of the show, it's clearly mocking like chuds. I don't know if you know this term chud, <laughs> um, but people that I would say have like really shitty, uh, unfounded, inconsistent, inconsiderate opinions and stuff like that's that's the main cast is that they're all terrible people um but it's rare that it would go so far as to show the other side to show like a reasonable side um and in this season not only did we have that that one the seminar episode which is just hilarious and a fantastic episode but uh throughout it it kind of seemed like they were positioning more and more that like some characters were reasonable in some situations um, like this whole arc of, of Mac coming out as gay, uh, at first I was like, well, what are they going to do with this? Is it just going to shift over to like another set of jokes? But they, but they now make him like, kind of like woke in some ways, um, to kind of <laughs> remind us that there are actually sane positions to have on these issues. Um, of course they don't go so far into just like preaching or anything, but it, it's close to, like, a lesson. It's close to there being a lesson available to learn. And, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the, the reassurance <laughs> um, that, of course, the people actually making the show and actually writing these characters are, are very sane, caring people that know what's actually going on in the world. Um, it's just something that it's nice to be reassured of in this day and age. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think this season was fantastic. Um, oh yeah, as I was saying, they, they really did go for some like big conceptual swings for the fences and stuff. Like the, the the other Gang Beats Boggs episode. I thought that's just like really hilarious conceptually and it delivered on all fronts what I could have been hoping for with that concept. Um, and then the, the last episode, oh man... Um, I really don't want to spoil it, but it's a pretty amazing moment. It's it's one of the few instances I can think of of anything in any medium so hugely deviating from every single structural and conventional uh, expectation of that medium in order to appreciate 
something completely different and to wholeheartedly present it and appreciate it sincerely, I was pretty blown away. Um, again, I don't want to spoil what it is, but you, you'll know what I'm talking about when you see it. It's like, it's one of those things where you're just like, wow, I cannot believe they've done this. So it's coming back for more. I don't know what it's going to be like when it comes back. I don't know if they're going to make any more changes or anything. Um, if they do, I hope it's kind of on the same level as they did in this season. Yeah, I don't know, man. It was a great season. The, the Super Bowl episodes, too, that was great. They, they just ran so far with the, the whole real-world situation of the Philadelphia Eagles winning the Super Bowl in, in such a satisfying way. There's, there's a moment at the end where they show clips of Phillies fans... No, Eagles fans. The Phillies is another Philadelphia team. Eagles fans celebrating all over the place. And it's just, like, heartwarming, you know? You can see the sort of things that the, the creators really do care about. Yeah. Yeah. All things considered, very happy with this. Uh, pretty, I was very happy with this, too. Um, happy is maybe not the right word. It is, as always, an extremely bleak and depressing show. Um, perhaps not as directly soul-crushingly despairing as, as season four. Um, but, you know, there's, <laughs> there's some sad things going on, for sure. Uh, when I first watched the first episode, I somehow got it into my head that the the themes of this season and the sort of plot structure that it would have was going to be some like crazy recursion based time looping complicated I, I referred to it as horse haruhi um, and I still believe based on what I saw that that there was like a reasonable that was like a reasonable assumption uh, unfortunately, that, that that didn't really pan out. In, in many other ways, it was just sort of like a normal season. Um, dang, I still think about how cool it would have been if they, they really ran with that premise. I don't know. I, 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 but what we got was really good, too. Um, I, I'm... Uh, it's like... I, I feel like they're getting to the point where they, they kind of have to just come up with arcs for each character each season. And there's, like, a bit of formulaicness that, like, creeps into that. Um, and it feels like they, all the really big structurally breaking episodes um, are, are meant to almost, like, distract from that. Distract from a formulaicness that seems to be creeping in. Uh, but they're done so well, all of these major format breaking episodes, that I can hardly complain. Um, even when an episode would start and I would be like, oh, okay, I get it, they're gonna do this. Oh, okay, it's never gonna cut away. Oh, okay, it's gonna show the same party this many times. Oh, okay. And it was like, by the end, though, I was convinced. I was convinced of the power of the structure. I had found myself totally engrossed and hypnotized by what they were doing. And, and same with the plot lines, too. Even when I, I kind of recognize, like, oh, this is going to be the thing for this character this season. Oh, this is what this person's going to be doing. Um, they still were able to have lessons that, that hit you. Um, major character revelations, usually very bleak revelations. That feeling of, like, the bowling ball hitting the piano where you're just like, yeah, okay, all right, I guess that's my problem. Um, that sort of thing was still handled really well. Um, and it's tough to make a narrative about really flawed characters that keep struggling to improve themselves and failing and falling back into the same traps without it seeming monotonous, without it seeming like it's losing the significance of those moments, but they're doing it. They're actually doing it. Um, it's hard, but it's not impossible. And, uh, I don't know, it, it gives me, um, I'm quite curious. Where, where can it go from here? Probably more of the same, but that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's really continuing to impress. I really think each season has been better than the, the one previous, and that this was no exception. Uh, this is another show I actually just started watching last year, got all caught up on. Uh, last year featured the end of Season 2 and the start of Season 3. Holy crap, I love this show. I, I think this show is just so, 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 so cool. Um, never have I seen something with such an ambitious premise, with such a complex and exciting storyline, 
that yet still feels like a sitcom, that is still written like a sitcom and has the humor of a sitcom and that I enjoy watching primarily as a sitcom. And the sitcom elements of the show I love so much. It's the same show creator as Parks and Rec and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and I think the American Office. I don't think they were the show creator for the American Office. I think they, they stepped into a major role somewhat through the, the series, but whatever. I, I haven't watched the American Office, but... I felt like I should clarify that. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember this guy's name either. This isn't really a helpful, informative thing. But the way this guy writes characters, uh, that they're, they're extremely wacky but inherently sympathetic, that they have like huge stables of jokes, like joke spaces, um, that you can just kind of like fire them off into, you know, that, that Eleanor is is manipulative human garbage and Jason is just extreme human garbage and Chidi is a nerd and Tahani is rich. You know, it's very basic kind of archetypical things, but they really well utilize jokes that always seem in character. And it's like you don't really have to overdefine the characters to allow this to happen. And then you allow a lot of like growth and development and and interpersonal relationships to flourish because you've like left enough space for that. I think that kind of character writing is is really key to a good sitcom, um, especially one where you want people to get like emotionally invested. And yeah, I, I'm getting pretty emotionally invested into this show. Um, there's some really beautiful moments, moments that like very nicely um, take all of the the build up and the tension and. Um, the hopes that you've accumulated over many, many episodes, um, like the, the kind of arc writing in this, I, I think stands up to, to the sort of thing I like to see in, in my favorite manga too. Um, and then even things that I never think I really care about. And usually in sitcoms, I'm just like, all right, okay, get it over with. Um, like, you know, romantic relationships between the characters and stuff. Like, that sort of thing really charmed me in this show. It really did. Um, I think because it's just such an, a bizarre premise that it's the accumulation of so many crazy things happening conceptually. And and the actual plot of the, the show I find, like, really intriguing, too. Um, I don't really want to spoil what it is. Uh, I, I would really just recommend you watch it from the start without learning anything more about it, except me telling you repeatedly that it's good. Um... <laughs> And, uh, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's really well done. It's, like, very clever. It's it's complex without feeling overly complicated. It's never really confusing um, because they, they consistently make very funny jokes of just, like, making everything hilariously simple. Um, there's, there's, like, a gravity to things. Like, they very nicely explain the significance of things. Um, but there's also just like a very fun, goofy irreverence where you're, you're always excited to see what form things will take, like what what people will turn out to be like. It kind of reminds me of One Piece in that regard, actually. I, I think it strikes the same sort of balance between um, intensity and, and just sort of a, a whimsicalness. Um, yeah, man, I don't know. I, I, succeeding on all colors. I, I remember at the end of season two when I, I kind of started to figure out what the premise of season three would be feeling a little like underwhelmed um feeling like i could kind of see what was coming and that it didn't seem anywhere near as interesting as the first two seasons but man i was wrong <laughs> uh you just wait it it gets uh it gets pretty crazy so yeah yeah um season three is now finished i'm extremely happy with the second half of season three i cannot wait to see what happens next i assume it's going to air in this fall the start of season four. Oh, I'm excited. Oh, what a great show. Honestly, it's quickly becoming one of my favorite sitcoms of all time. And uh, it feels even wrong just to call it a sitcom at this point. But there is some stuff I liked even better. Like the second season of Atlanta. Oh, baby. This is one that, again, it has a lot of sitcom appeal to me. And the, the character interactions and the sort of attachment I've had with the characters. But it goes so far beyond that. Um, we talked at some length in a previous video about, like, the first five or six episodes of this show, uh, and how amazed and blown away I was by them, and the rest of the season did not disappoint a little. 
Um, again, just working so richly with different genres, different settings. There's like a whole flashback episode that takes place when the main characters are in high school that is just so authentic, like disturbingly so. Like I felt that I was being triggered uh, to, to relive stress from like, God, when was I in high school? Like over 10 years ago. Um, terrifying. <laughs> That I, that I actually had high school stress again. Um, other episodes that were like a little less conceptually dense, um, like this one that the screen cap is from, where they're just trying to go play a concert and things keep going wrong, um, were, were proof, if anything, that this show could sustain itself, even if all they did was just like normal kind of adventure, kind of sitcom -y type plots. Uh, the, just the character writing is just so there that, that the characters are so well defined um, and that the inherent tensions between them and just the small incompatibilities and the, the differing perspectives and outlooks and stuff, like that's enough. That's enough. That, those most basic ingredients are enough to make this show compelling and excellent. And yet, you know, man, Donald Glover, like... I don't like everything he's done as a musician. I'm, I complain all the time, but actually as a musician lately, he's been pretty impressing me too. But as a director, as a show writer, holy crap, this the guy just does not settle at all. This is a guy that will, will go to the work of making this amazing like character structure and then will challenge himself to throw that into just such amazing disparate situations to to pluck characters from it and give them complete solo episodes um to shine the light on like other parts of the cast that that may seem before then underdeveloped but like immediately as you watch the episode you realize that they actually had like a substance to their character, they had all of this potential in them already, like, ah, oh, ah, oh, I was blown away, I was blown away, but then, on top of all of that, the cinematography, oh my god, this show is so beautifully shot, um, shoot, what's the guy's name, Hiro Takai, no, Hiro something, Hiro Nep, it's a Japanese name. Anyways, I'm pretty sure his first name is Hiro. Um, is a just jaw-droppingly good director. <laughs> um, some of the shots in this this show, I would I would even put on like Kubrick level, like just the sort of way he frames things, the the length of the shots he uses, the the beautiful film grain that they bring out for this. It's like ah, uh, I. I really feel like I'm watching a, a, a filmic experience of the highest order. Kino. I go so far as to call it Kino. <laughs> I, I don't even know. I don't even know like what makes it so good. Um, I, I think part of it is like uh, a great sense of naturalness in the set design and the location shoots um, that you always feel like you're seeing a slice of what it really is like in Atlanta. Not that I would know, but it feels that way. Um, and then a lot to do with like the framing. He very, very rarely will do conventional shots. Everything always is like a little different just to kind of keep you interested, just so that you're never really sure where anything is going. Um, a lot of shots like this one, I think this is a pretty good example where things are shot like very wide the characters are kind of standing in a row, which has like a nice kind of kino appeal. Um, and then there's this like great density behind of like the trees and stuff. Like this, this wonderful naturalistic shot with lots of pedestrians mulling about and stuff. And you're like, what is going to happen in this shot, right? Like, what are we going to focus on? Is it going to be the characters talking to each other? Is it just to see the action of the bus pulling up? Is it to really land this point of how out of place they are in these pajamas, standing in the early dawn outside of a campus? 
Um, the answer is all of them. It's all of those things and more. And that the, the potential for all of them flows out of the scene so, so easily with, without kind of awkward cuts, without uh, terrible zoom-ins and reframings and stuff. It's just there. It's just like the perfect painting on which the rest of the scene is painted. I don't know, man. I, I could go on for days. I, I was so impressed with, with all of these little things in this show. All right. Here's my prediction for season three. This is kind of spoilers, I guess. So um, the season two was Robin season. And, and I thought, this was really clever. And, and I really like this sort of thing. In, in every episode, there was a robbery. And some of them were very explicit. Uh, some of them were were kind of more like systematic things that you, you think about. And you're like, oh, yeah, that really is a robbery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then in the last episode, it seems like there was no robbery at all. So here's my prediction, is that the moving company that Earn hired to move his cousin's stuff robbed them. It was, it was a scam. They just took all of his stuff. And then we're going to find that out at the start of season three. And it's like that the only, the only way you could have figured that out is by noticing the pattern of, of robbery in every season. It's very good. And I'm using my, my noggin for that one. We'll see if I'm right. Hopefully sooner than later. I, I don't know if season three has been announced. I don't know if it's... I, I assume that it's going to happen just because everyone loves this show and... Uh, I, I would be so, so disappointed if he decided to move on. But, man, at this point, like, if Donald Glover, like, directs a movie or something, I'm probably going to go see it. And I can feel myself from years ago when Donald Glover was just childish Gambino and he was making terrible mixtapes, screaming out at the me of today, like, what happened to you, man? This, this show happened. <laughs> this show, <laughs> it's changed me. I see the light. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Last thing I want to talk about is this. <laughs> oh God! So I put I put the first season of this onto uh, onto my best anime list the year it came out, and critics were vexed. Uh, people were not happy about me calling it an anime or calling it good. But guess what? This show is great. <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, this Christmas special that came out this year, while not a full season, um, I, I think really was. Fantastic. I wasn't sure if I should put it on the sort of the movie list, but whatever. <clears throat> it kind of feels like it may have started off as season two, which I've heard a lot of rumors about. I thought it was coming, but we got this instead, whatever. Um, there's kind of an episodicness to a lot of the different things that happen uh, that, that feels like it could have been episodes in a season. Um, but that, I think, is was really geniusly counterbalanced by... Uh, the the major arcs of this the special the things that end up being like the major threat which you look back and were actually foreshadowed thematically and through small plot developments that didn't seem so important at the time you see what I'm saying that's clever you trick them into thinking that things are disjoint but then there's actually like a, a hidden thread of connection um, another show that did that well was Evangelion and I mentioned that for no reason. <laughs> um, there's there's some really hilarious moments. I, I think this joke that I've screen capped here is is perhaps one of my favorite of 2018, uh, where they they explain to our MC that they've decided to give up on selling any sort of products, that all they have now is this stand with the logo, so that you could take your picture with the logo, and that that really is the highest form of branding. That that is the the final goal of any brand is just to be the logo. <laughs> I thought that was so hilarious. That's such an amazing idea. Um, oh, crap, I just leave the window. It's like snowing really heavily. I'm supposed to get dinner tonight with some friends, but... Oof. Anyways. Um, so, yeah. I don't, I, I don't really want to spoil too much of what the plot is about. Um... It's, again, kind of like Neo Yokio, just this insane mashup of, of tropes across many mediums and genres and movements, um, all of which individually appeal to me, like high fashion, hip-hop, anime, um, the kind of like sad boy mumblecore movement, all of these things I love. So, again, it's like insane to me that the show exists. <laughs> it feels like someone has just been, been reading my dreams. <clears throat> um... Uh, and 
I, I again, I don't want to spoil too much, but I'll, I'll leave you with this slight hint that the ending, whew, I, I never really thought the show had like great animation. I thought it was like definitely serviceable and, and sometimes pretty good, but they went all out on uh, a, just a really amazing tribute to one of the most iconic things in all of anime. So for you haters out there telling me to keep this off my anime list, no. When you see the ending of this, you'll realize other anime ain't got shit. <laughs> yeah, these are the shows I watched. Uh, I maybe saw like an episode or two of other things, but these are the ones that I, I deliberately set out to watch. Uh, overall, I was pretty happy. I'd say this is the tipping point where I, I was like really happy. Before this, there's like some measure of disappointment, but uh, all these shows I thought were pretty great. I'm looking forward to seeing more of all of them, and maybe picking up some other shows too. I started watching Gumball, The Amazing World of Gumball. Holy crap, that is an amazing show. So probably I will try to uh, get caught up on that and watch that more regularly. Alright, that's all. Bye-bye.